All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to One Million Cups today. Uh, for those of you that it, this is your first time, um, we're really happy to have you. It's super casual, so feel free during the presentation to get up and help yourself to crinkle donut bowls or um, some of the crescendo coffee. A few quick announcements um, that I wanted to plug. One, um, for those of you who are familiar with Joy Tang and Markable, who was one of our presenters early on at One Million Cups, she got some awesome press this last week. She signed an exclusive deal with New York's Fashion Week. Um, she has a really neat fashion app um, that I don't know if I'll do justice explaining, so I suggest you look it up. Um, it's a great way to shop online and get some good deals, and she's really making some headway um, you know, both nationally and internationally, and is based right out of 100, 100 State and Madison. So um, congrats to her. We also have a generator event coming up, the co-founder of The Ring, um, which is the video conferencing doorbell, is going to be at Generator on June 2nd. So if you're interested, um, that's tomorrow night, and it's at 5.30. He was on Shark Tank, so it might be fun to have a conversation and learn more about his experience. We also have the Wisconsin Technology Council's um, Entrepreneur Conference. Um, that's coming up on June 7th and 8th. I know Mr. Corson and I will be there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a moderator for Understory, uh, who is a startup out of Madison that moved to Boston and now is coming back to the area. And um, they're actually going to present at One Million Cups in August. So stay tuned for that. Um, Final announcement is that One Million Cups has teamed up with the Doyen Group for Forward Fest this year. We're going to have a 5x5x5 five by five by five where a female entrepreneur business owner will walk, around, walk away with a $5,000 check at the end of the event. So um, more details to come on that, but we're really excited to be a part of that. So in true One Million Cups fashion, we're going to thank our sponsors today. We have Field 59, Derek's back there behind the camera. If you ever can't make One Million Cups, you can visit our live stream link. It's on our webpage, and you can tune right in. We also have um, video recordings of all our past presenters, so you can check them out. And we're obviously thank you, uh, thankful for the library in this awesome space. We get a cool view here. So thank you, Ed. Um, and you can feel free to plug the library when we get to you in intros. And then finally, 100 State, who has provided the coffee from Crescendo. So it's really, truly a community. There's Ruth. Are you going to come on? <laughs> um, yeah. It's truly a community effort to get this program going. So we're really grateful. Um, and we're going to go around now and do some introductions. So we don't have the mic anymore. We found that it was a little more discussion-y and informal when we didn't use it. So you're going to have to like just know when it's your turn and, and pop up. But I'm Rachel Neal. I'm one of the organizers of One Million Cups, and I also work at Nordic Consulting. <laughs> Hello, uh, <laughs> Teresa Feiner. I'm a consultant with food and agricultural companies. <coughs> and I feel my oh, um, I'm Andy Quant. I'm presenting today with the bike mobile. Oh, Sabrina Madison. Most folks just call me Progress, motivational speaker and social entrepreneur. Nicole Jenkins, I'm Director of Sales of American Printing and a uh, Madison Area Connectors member. Uh, Eric Lawrenson, Capital Times. Alex Ryan with Sun Power Corporation in the solar space, looking to get back into startups. Laura Chantos, Program Coordinator with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Joey Freen, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Uh, ben Falk, Robert W. Baird. Ken Woodford, also with Baird. Dan Anderson with Baker Tilly. Peter Benson, Colonial Banker, Park Bank. Uh, Nick Lombardino, Farwell, and also Madison Area Connectors. I'm Ruth Rowling, the Business Development Specialist for the city. I'm Steve Quant, Andy's dad, and uh, tech chair here in town. I'm Matt Health, Independent Digital Marketing Consultant. Austin Streeper with the North Star Resource Group. Uh, Jacob Hamas with Morgan Stanley and Madison Area Connectors. Uh, Brooke Wyland, I'm a freelance scientific illustrator. Travis Human, uh, owner of Stray Cat Bicycles. I'm Kendra Bishop with the Alexander Company. I'm Maddie Niebauer. Uh, I run a firm called The Chief, which provides virtual chief of staff support. 
Um, my name is Ed Graves. I'm a business librarian here. Talk to me about market research, business <coughs> planning, stuff at the library, also um, using our space for functions and meetups. This is me, Chauvin, uh, organizer of Million Cups and Help Box Ventures. Molly Siegel, I'm with Taliban. Joel Martin, I'm at Nordic with Bridge. I'm Drew Corson, I'm an attorney with Knight Boucher, I specialized in securities law. And I'm Rachel's personal assistant. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. He's the witty one of you. So <laughs> stay tuned. And, if, and I think you have to give your plugs that if it looks like you're thinking you're going to call on them. Oh, so this is the problem. We had the mic, and I always used to run the <laughs> mic, but now my, I've become totally inessential here. But <laughs> there aren't any questions. I'm either going to ask a dumb question myself, or I'm going to look at you right in the eye and be like, what's your question? So just be prepared. Some cold calling. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so. On that note, we're going to turn things over to Andy, so come on up. Thank you. I'm the bike mobile. Um, the bike mobile. Um, A um, little bit about what I do. The Bike Mobile is a mobile bicycle repair shop. Um, I specialize in multiple bicycle tune-ups um, at home, on site, or for groups like neighborhoods and um, businesses. Um, uh, tomorrow I'll be doing my fourth on-site um, corporate wellness day um, so far. Um, let's see here. So, um, why am I doing it? Here's a picture of me. I think I was 12 or 13 years old in this picture, um, and I just kind of started hanging around the local bike shop. I live up in Lake Mills. Um, those guys would let me kind of take care of the basic repairs um, in exchange for the shop discount that I could get. Um, I got my first track mountain bike um, that summer um, and then upgraded to a nicer one the following summer once I learned how to build them. Um, that was about 1991. Um, that was my prep for having the greatest college job around, and that's working at a bike shop in college. So in 96, I started at Budget Bicycle Center, um, and then on and off um, in between jobs. Um, whenever I was lucky enough to not have a real job, I would get to go work at the bike shop for the summer. Um, so I've done um, thousands of tune-ups, um, thousands of re or, uh, used bicycle refurbishments for Budget Bicycle Center over the years, um, building, um, assembling new bikes, and so on. Um, it's pretty safe to say it's all I've ever really wanted to do with fixed bikes. Um, you know, I've had other jobs that I've enjoyed, great work experiences, but um, even the best jobs that I had at Still Moonlight at the bike shop or be fixing bikes at home and building them myself. Um, one reason I never decided to just go ahead and start a bike shop is um, I've always told myself I can't make a living with a bike shop, um, and I have pretty good reasons for that. Um, startup costs are really high, about um, half a million dollars, I think, in inventory. Um, you know, shop space, um, employees, everything um, you would need to get started. Um, the current market is dominated by corporate stores like the Trek stores or Eric's Bikes um, and Amazon. People can buy parts, some parts on Amazon cheaper than I can get them from my wholesaler. Um, the Madison service market here, if I just wanted to have a, a place to tune up bikes, um, is pretty saturated with um, great mechanics and great shops, guys that I used to work with at Budget have gone on to open their own shops in town. They're all very talented and um, a great place to take your bike to be fixed. Um, adding one more to the mix isn't going to do a whole lot of good for anybody. Um, and so, um, and then uh, I live out in Lake Mills where <coughs> most of the cyclists there either work at Trek already, it's only 10 miles down the road, or their neighbor works there or their family member or something so they can get bikes. Uh, there's just not enough customers right there. So. Um, to, to address some of the, the problems in the marketplace, uh, I've joined some Facebook groups or done some research, and one thing that keeps coming up is, yeah, you have to have a brick and mortar shop because the internet can't fix your bike. Um, so I identified that as a problem right away. Um, you know, I believe that entrepreneurs should be looking for problems. If we're doing our jobs right, um, we look for problems. We don't necessarily just focus on the solution. So. Um, you know, I heard that and I said, well, why not? You know, what, what am I competing with? You know, Amazon, anything you want in the world, you can go to Amazon and order it. Two days later, it shows up on your doorstep. 
um, why can't we do that with bicycle maintenance? Um, so that's kind of one of the, the seeds um, that started the idea. Um, all of my bike shop experience had been from the inside out, um, and it's been all about the bikes and making them work. Um, I never really put myself in the customer's shoes um, and, you know, to kind of um, figure out what the problem is. Um, and one of the biggest problems that I identified, if I were to go into a bike shop and be tasked with improve our service, um, the first thing would be make it easier to get the bikes into the shop. Um, and so that too, I'm like, well, once you go get them, fix them, then you got to return them. That's two trips. Let's just make it one, put the shop inside the van. Um, I had the aha moment. So like any time I have a good idea or something I just don't know too much about, um, I Google it. So um, I Googled it and it turns out this is a thing um, that I hadn't heard about. Um, there are two other um, startups out there right now doing this relatively successfully and um, are pursuing franchise models. And um, from what I can tell, um, finding some success with that. The first is Velofix. They're out of Vancouver. Um, they focus on racers, high end. They're like a pro shop. That's how they um, build themselves. Um, very expensive bikes. Um, most of their clients are going to have a lot of money. Um, they show up at races and that kind of thing and, and cater to that. Um, they actually won um, Dragon's Den is what the Shark Tank is called in Canada, I guess. Um, so they were on that and won, and uh, that's how they got their started. Their start um, to buy into that franchise, I estimated it'd be about $150,000 initial investment. And then I'd have to be open nine to nine every single day of the week and do all these things that I just didn't think I really wanted to do. Um, and then uh, the other one is Beeline Bikes out of San Francisco. They are really killing it with the corporate accounts and corporate wellness in Silicon Valley. Um, they claim to have 100 corporate accounts already. Um, they too started with just one band, kind of built it out, and then, whoa, we've got something better here. Um, they, uh, I guess last July, they secured their Series A funding of $2.6 million, um, which I think is um, tremendous. Um, and to buy into their franchise, I, I figured it out about $80,000. And this is just with some Googling around and um, guessing. So it could be a little bit different than that. But the same story. Um, I'm locked into their program. Um, it'd be a, you know, nine to nine, I'd have to be open certain hours. Um, what they're doing um, is really on the front end is with development costs. Um, they have proprietary software that they've developed that handles all the scheduling, inventory, um, just about all the business functions because there's no shortage of bicycle mechanics or service managers that are looking for a new opportunity, but they don't have much small business experience. I happen to have a little small business experience, corporate jobs, and that kind of thing that I was able to apply to do it myself. So um, I had the idea, my aha moment was about March 1st of this year. Um, by March 12th, I bought the van. Uh, a couple days later, I formed the LLC. Um, I, um, in order to get a um, wholesale account, I needed a physical um, location. So I'm renting a foyer of an old <laughs> warehouse building in Lake Mills to ship product to, and it's good enough. Um, I don't know, then everything just started happening and, um, you know, right, <laughs> on, right away I started calling everybody. I know I just kind of come off of a, a job search that, man, I did not like that, but I made contact with a lot of HR professionals in town, so I just emailed them all and said, hey, I've got this great business idea, what do you think? And every single one of them said, hey, that's something we'd take a look at. So I did stuff like that. Um, I met with a few of them. Um, I, um, I've been using a business coach through uh, the Small Business Development Center here in the university, um, Michelle. She's great. I um, met with her. Um, she introduced me to a business model canvas. I filled out one of those, which was very enlightening. I uh, connected with a Velofix operator out of um, Boulder, picked his brain, um, did, did all kinds of things. Set up the POS with Lightspeed. POS It's a retail um, point of sale system that's specific to the bike industry, so it's really slick um, where you know, I can place an order with quality bike parts and it's all through that system. So when my inventory is low, I just click a button and it reorders for me. Um, all of these things that Velofix and Beeline are spending all this development costs on, I found out there already. The booking software that I use is just uh, a pointlet. It's 15 bucks a month and I just, it's just a link. It's super easy. Um, you know, I hardly touch this thing and just every once in a while my phone beeps and I've got an appointment. Um, and it's, it's really working well without all $2.6 million of funding, <laughs> you know. Um, so by um, April 11th, I placed my first parts order and tools order, and on April 18th, I had completed my first two tune-ups and swiped my first car. So um, six weeks from concept to revenue. Um, 
part of the, the journey was, you know, how am I different than the other guys that are doing this? You know, I don't know, maybe I'm arrogant, but I'm like, I can do it better than them, or, you know, my way is going to be better. Um, but how, you know, really? And, um, you know, like I said, I was focusing on the problem, and, and really there's a lot of inconvenience in, in the cycling industry, and specifically the, the bike shops and brick and mortar shops, and how it just works. So. Um, I, I started thinking about the people that aren't riding their bikes. There's millions of bikes in garages just hanging there with flat tires or some clicking or creaking the last time it was ridden or it, it was too difficult or uncomfortable. All kinds of excuses. So I'm uh, helping people connect with cycling in their own unique way as conveniently as possible. And I imagine a world where uncertainty and inconvenience are no longer barriers to an enjoyable cycling experience. Um, I'm trying to really keep it simple here. Um, and I'm, I'm targeting non-cyclists, um, ironically enough. Um, people that are really into cycling have really nice bikes. They've been doing it long enough. They know what they want. They, they're really specific with what they want. They go to the bike shop and get it, or they go to Amazon and order it and put it on themselves. Um, they don't need my help. You know, They've already got it figured out, or they're already plugged into that program and okay with it, or they've gotten a car rack that's easy to use to you know, schlep the bike around. Um, so I'm trying to keep it really simple for just the average Joe, which is why it's really easy. I mean, it's, I think four clicks from, you get to my website, and there's four clicks, and your appointment's scheduled. You know, I, I wanted to get that to three, but I couldn't figure out a way to do it. But it's super easy, and I don't have to touch it. You know, I get frustrated when people call me on the phone. It's like, just click, you know. <laughs> it's Amazon for bikes. Um, so targeting non-cyclists, everybody has a bike, they're not being ridden. Um, my service options are pretty simple too. At first I did all this a la carte stuff and it got really complicated, but I just focused primarily on tune-ups. Um, you know, you schedule an appointment with me, I show up, I'm gonna get your bike working, whether you like it or not. Uh, but I have three levels, so a quick tune-up, if it's really just flat tires and it hasn't been ridden in a, in a couple of years, it doesn't take a whole lot, you know, just some lube, some adjustments, some air. Um, so that's a quick tune-up. A full tune-up is somebody that has a bike that's been ridden a lot and has, just hasn't been serviced in a while, needs the wheels trued, um, maybe some tires replaced, you know, some grips. Um, I call that a full tune-up. And then uh, there's a pro tune-up for the active cyclist, um, the commuter, um, somebody that really wants their bike, you know, taken apart and put back together again. <coughs> I do offer, um, I was very surprised. I would say 90% of my appointments are for more than one bicycle. So I started offering discounts for multiple bicycles um, because once I'm there, a lot of you know the costs are um, absorbed. So um, parts and accessories, I stock um, only quality brand name parts, you know Shimano or SRAM parts basically, um, and then I'll have like two price points: the one that's going to work on 90% of the bikes, and then something nice for the person that says I want something nice. Um, but I don't get really specific. I just kind of know from my past experience, shop experience, what works and what doesn't. Um, I either service at your home. Um, I just park in your driveway around the street, the flattest spot possible. That's been a problem. With, you know, <laughs> like um, I work right in the van too, if uh, that hasn't been clear yet. Um, I have a sprinter van that I can stand up in, and the bench is right there. I did that just by Google imaging these other guys and seeing inside their van. And I think I made some improvements to that system too. But <laughs> Um, the other thing besides at home are corporate or groups um, where you schedule me for the day, you can pay $500 and I'll just be there all day and I'll, I can do up to 10 bikes. Or um, a direct pay option where I discount everything, those three service levels I can discount. Well, I try to focus on full tune-ups for those um, and people can bring their bikes in and then um, the employees or the group members pay individually at a discounted rate um, and parts are always extra. Um, I, I have a pretty good stock in the van of, of what it takes, but it hardly ever gets over 50 bucks in parts. Um, so that's keeping it simple. Um, people have been loving it. Um, I've been, this is my seventh week. I've done 115 tune-ups approximately. I, I think I'm like right at 113, 115. I'm keeping a little tally on the wall in the van. Um, I would say 30 of these bikes were actively being ridden by people that, you know, I mean, it's really working on um, creating cyclists. I mean, these people are like, oh my God, where have you been all my life? Um, <laughs> I've done three um, corporate days already. The first one was yep. a little dicey, but the, try, next, the second you know, one was a little bit better. The third was great. I'm doing my fourth tomorrow. Um, that's going to be a corporate sponsored one, so I have a full 10 bikes. You know, Everybody's getting their bikes tuned up for free, so it's going to be a long day. Um, but that's great. I love it. 
Um, I have three other big deals in the works with some large employers in the area. Um, you know, referrals are, you know, great right now. Um, I've uh, joined the DMI uh, Bicycle Subcommittee um, and uh, getting involved with that. That led to um, getting involved with the Bike Feds Bike Valet for the concerts on the square. I'm going to be parking next to the valet, so I'll be there, um, you know, I call them free safety checks, um, where I can just kind of check things over and make suggestions and, you know, maybe make some quick adjustments on the fly. Um, and then I've uh, been invited to do safe support for the Capital City Triathlon, which will uh, be my first foray into that racing world, um, which kind of scares me a little bit um, because it's really hard to be everything to, you know, the people that are really picky about what, you know, I mean, they're rightfully picky about what they want on their bikes. I just can't stock all those parts, but still, um, you know, it's a big segment for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, it's successful. I want I want to do great things. I, I can see myself, you know, with a, a brand that's stronger and better and bigger than Velo Fix or Beeline. Um, I just um, I don't really know how to get there. Um, so for right now, I'm just thinking about what I can handle. Um, the when I was a boy, there was Gibbs Bike Shop in Lake Mills. Um, this old man um, had a little shop, and I would walk in there and smell the tires and see him behind the service counter, and I really related with that to the point of naming my son Gibson. And when he was born, um, I was given as a gift the original sign of Gibbs Bike Shop that had been hanging, hanging up in the local tavern. Um, things stink, but um, it's all good now. And as luck would have it, about two weeks ago, um, that property came on the market in Lake Mills, and I have an accepted offer in on that property, and hopefully going to be moving in there in the next couple months. Um, it's got a three-bedroom apartment upstairs, which is perfect for myself and my two kids. Um, so I'll have a shop, or at least a creative home base, to start testing out ideas and um, you know, further proving some business models. Um, local growth opportunity, I can do nights and weekends if I find somebody else to run my van. Um, Regional expansion, it just makes sense being located in Lake Mills. I can go out towards Oconomowoc or Milwaukee. Um, and then obviously national markets, you know, it's a, it's a franchisable um, business model, I think. Um, but I, I certainly need some help to get there. Um, so help. Um, <laughs> this is what I do. I just kind of sit around drink coffee in my van. Um, I hang out with my bike. Um, you know, I think the market's really ripe for this. It is the next wave of bicycle maintenance. Um, it, you know, this is where things are headed. Um, you know, the, the shops, I think shops are going to have to be buying vans and doing it themselves. Um, everything's being redefined right now. So I think if, if we got to it before they do, um, it could be a real winner, which is, I think, what um, Velofix and Beeline and their investors have found as well. Um, I'm really uh, inexperienced in terms of the investment world or scaling a business or any of that. So that's my ask today is if anybody um, has any experience with that and would like to talk to me and um, kind of either knock me down a couple pegs or boost me up, whatever it may be. Um, it's pretty easy to schedule coffee with me. Um, I with, Through my booking software, I have a link I can send you and you can pick a time and uh, I can work in between appointments. Um, I usually leave an hour for that. It's called Coffee with Q. And, uh, it's, I don't know, people have been liking that. I, I love just sitting down and talking to like-minded people and, and kind of talking things through. Um, and one last thing, I'm going to plug um, a couple people here from Madison Area Connectors. It's a, um, a, a networking group that I'm part of, and we have a, um, a benefit for Chins Up um, next week. And Nick, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be, thanks, Andy. I'd be happy to. Um, for the sake of, of the forum, maybe we'll do some Q&A with you first, and then I'll selfishly take over and, and plug the uh, event. I just don't want to take away from your sure. from your time. Good thing. Yeah. We'll do it after. Yeah, I got a question. <laughs> Can you tell us about the June 8th event at Madison Area Connect? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, serious question. Um, of the 115 bikes, approximately, that you've been able to service so far, how many of those are attributed to servicing corporate accounts? Um, probably about 25 or 30. Okay. Yeah. Most most stops are about three bikes. You know, two bikes, something like that. Mm -hmm. I have a trade-in program too, so I've been accumulating a lot of bikes. You know, so I might trade somebody a tune-up for the bike that they're not riding, and then I take that home. 
um, started collecting kids bikes because they move pretty quickly in the used market um, but they're just kind of filling up my garage right now and hopefully I'll start filling up space at Gibbs Bike Shop when I open it back up. And that very first picture of your van? Yes. That was you standing next to it with a bicycle way back towards the beginning? Yes. You, are you, it looks like you're dressed in a suit. Is that, just curious, was that subliminal? Is that to send a message to people that work in offices? Hey, we can repair your, well, or was it any intention at all? I'm just curious. You know, so my, uh, my father-in-law owns Dollars and Cents Magazine here in town, the Coupon Magazine, and I've been helping him with that business for the last year and a half or so, and that's kind of been my nine-to-fiver. Um, sort of, um, and so that's just kind of how I was dressing for a while. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wore a lot of sport clothes, and, you know, and my friends from Mac can uh, attest to that, that. I finally, you know, I traded in my sport coat for like a cool Dickies work coat, but then it got warm. So. I got another really deep question. Um, another picture of your van later. What, what do you have written right underneath the window on the side there? Um, I, I, I could see everything except that maybe the last word. Pedal through the crest. Um, the crest. A, a, yeah, so um, I was reading something online about riding in groups, and when you're leading a group of cyclists through the hills, if you get to the top and you're the leader and you stop pedaling, you know, a lot of people you get to the top of the hill and you're like, oh, thank God. The guy in the back gets dropped, and it's really rude. So you have to pedal all the way through and start pedaling down the hill to drag the people. And I just thought it was a nice metaphor for leadership and um, a good thing to do if you're starting a business and something to keep you motivated. So it is a deep question. I have a uh, comment and a question. One, I just scheduled some service for Monday morning. So oh, great. It took like a few slides to convince me. So you <laughs> both my bikes and I'm really excited. Um, my question is, so... You know, you're on the cusp of like a bunch of different potential directions. Um, five years from now, what's your ideal outcome? Would you be a franchisor overseeing a bunch of franchises? Would you be, you know, a person who would deploy one or more vans locally and then have Gibbs? What's what's the ideal? Yeah, you know, that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, the I was having what I call a, a prof ex existential professional crisis, which led to this great idea. What am I going to do with my life? And now that I have it, I'm just faced with a different, you know, existential <laughs> professional crisis. Like, I love fixing bikes. I love proving the model here locally, um, and I, I'm willing to do it. But I also love, you know, business development and the idea of scaling something and, you know, making it really big and changing an industry or something like that. So I'm open to all of it at this point, which is why I just kind of want to, you know, be meeting people like everybody here and talking through it a little bit follow my nose. I don't know what the best answer is yet. Um, as one of those internet bike companies that doesn't actually do repairs, I think this is a great idea uh, to completely separate it from you know, the sales and the, the um, repairs. Um, but as a question is, have you thought about any sort of corporate partnerships with other groups that are not, like bike industry groups that are not specifically um, you know, a bike shop. So, like, we have a pretty good partnership with one or two of the bike shops in town where if somebody wants service, we refer them, we refer people to them, and if somebody wants a bike that they don't have, they come to us. Mm -hmm. So, like, is there any of that, like, have you found anybody that... Not yet. Have? You know, I mean, I think things are pretty new. Um, I, I know um, most of the shop owners in town, um, you know, on that, but uh, other... Um, other partnerships, you know, I'm just kind of starting more on a community level, I think. Um, you know, I'm meeting, um, you know, Planet Bike has asked me to join them for the Bike Week, um, the John Nolan commuter station. Um, so I'm connecting with people, you know, I guess is the best answer I have for that at this point. But I'm certainly, you know, looking to make those connections. You know, the, the one logical step once I have the space is to start carrying new bikes. And, you know, um, one of my ideas for the four new bikes and the bikes that I'm into is uh, practical bikes for practically anyone. I just came up with that the other day. But, uh, you know, repurposing bikes that are already existing or, like you do, design a frame that can, you know, support many different types of bikes um, and building them myself, you know, from new, um, new parts. Uh, one last question. Would it be possible, and this, I'm mainly asking this because I had a flat tire on Monday and didn't have the tools, so I ended up having to call Green Cap and slept the bike home. Is, are you thinking about doing like a, an emergency 
picked up like, hey, you know. It's, you know, it's one of those things. If I got the call and I was just driving around town and nearby, right. you might get lucky. And sure, I'll come help you. Why not? You know, if I have the time. But I just don't see how it would fit into the business model. It really is important that it's appointment based. Mm -hmm. I found the um, even when the, um, my, my corporate clients, if they pay for me to be there for the day, I require people to schedule appointments at a time, tell me a little bit about their bikes, what they need done, so I can prepare for it, you know. Um, something like that, you know, sure, I'll fix your flat for a hundred bucks, you know, right. it's like, I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know how you'd fit it in, because usually if a flat fix is 20 bucks, and just, it's not cost effective for me to be doing that. But I'm a nice guy. <laughs> Well, do you try to plan it out so that you're regionally, you know you're going to be in a particular area and you try to hit an area or you pretty much, you know, anything that comes in, comes in? I've had to make a couple of adjustments, you know, if it's like um, Middleton in the morning and then Sun Prairie and then back to Middleton or something like that, it's, you know, that's a big pain in the butt. Um, but I've only, you know, of all the appointments I've had so far, I mean, I'm in week seven, um, maybe I've had to do that twice. Or something will come up like this. I had to bump a guy to Friday, I think. You know, uh -huh. um, so I haven't had to do a whole lot of that. I get, I've been getting lucky a lot, um, and then twice or three times I've screwed it up, and you know, like I ended up driving us on Prairie because I didn't know where a Canto was. And, you know, it's on the west side. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. You know, whereas I was right there. So uh -huh. um, I'm getting better with it. You know, it's not a huge area. Um, I, I live in Lake Mills. My wife keeps a home in Blue Mounds, so. Uh, for her and her kids, so I'm, I have two homes anyway, and I'm bouncing back and forth all the time, so for me it's not that big of a deal, but, um, you know, I think, you know, the Madison market might be able to support two vans, at east and a west, to, to avoid that, but then the scheduling gets a little bit more complicated. Because, well, know, I can totally see, I can see you totally doing this, like a, an ice cream truck, you put some sort of bell on the top of this thing and drive through neighborhoods yeah. and see if the kids come running and get yeah. the bikes fixed. If you just hit an area. I know, but kids don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> they have credit cards. Yeah. What's the seasonality of this? I mean, because your winter, I assume, is going to be pretty dead. Yeah, I don't know. Um, ramen noodle winter, I guess. Um, you know, the, the the season really is like March, um, you know, um, bike uh, that, that second week of March, I guess, or first week of March every year. And that's, you know, usually when you get your first nice day. So at that point, the season starts, but then there's a lull. Um, and then really September, it just dies off. And I haven't experienced it yet. Maybe with some added convenience, people will still be tuning their bikes up in October. Um, but you're right. It's basically a six month season, which is one of the reasons why the franchise model wouldn't work for me here. Now Velofix is a Canadian company and they're in Toronto and Montreal and their climate's the same so they're making it work. I don't know. I don't know how they're making it work. I haven't quite cracked that. Oh, um, so I think, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing they're also the population, right? You have a lot more people uh, in those cities. Yes, correct. So, yeah, yeah, so maybe that's um, helping them along. Yeah. You know, St. Louis has a Velofix. Um, I mean, it's a little bit better there, um, but not much. Um, so. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm going to do this winter. Um, there's a Culver's going up in Lake Mills, so maybe they need help. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, then we'll turn it over to Nick. Anyone parting thoughts? Hey, Andy. Uh, can you talk about your trade-in program? How, if, if the bike is beyond repair, and what, what you can do with them to help Sure. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, I call them mid-90s mountain bikes out there, um, the older Trek hybrids um, that were popular when I first started. Um, and uh, they're getting to the point now where they really need a lot of parts replaced and the value's not there, so it doesn't become cost effective to, to fix them. You know, it might be $300. It's happened to me yesterday with one of my neighbors. Um, and so I'll just take those in on a trade-in and maybe have something better used or ideally new. Um, I can do that. But also, it's like a family might have five bikes in their garage and two of them aren't being ridden and I'm able to take the bikes that aren't being ridden on trade for service. Um, and then those bikes I refurbish. So that's something I can do in the winter, right, is refurbish these bikes. Um, it doesn't generate cash, but it'll maybe generate more revenue the following summer for the next winter. I don't know what I'm gonna do this winter, but. So there is a trade-in program. I, I, I'm not comfortable with um, how that's developed in my mind yet to really put it on my website or like, you know, market it yet. 
but it's certainly something I offer when I see the opportunity. And I go home with a couple bikes every day, it seems like. So <laughs> it's insane over at my house. <laughs> you know, my neighbors are like, thank God he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Andy. That was great. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there'll be some time afterwards to, to chat one on one. But uh, Nick, take away. Yeah, just really quick, guys. So, um, like Andy mentioned, he's a member of uh, a group called Madison Area Connectors. We call it MAC. Um, it is a it is a networking group, but um, you can kind of think of it more as like a professional family. So we 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 meet on a weekly basis. We you know collaborate on ideas, share frustrations. Um, and kind of the cornerstone of the group is philanthropic work through fundraising, volunteering, and whatnot. Um, so next week, Wednesday, at the East Side Club, from 4 to 7, we are hosting a networking fundraiser for a local nonprofit called the Chins Up Foundation. So what they do is they connect disadvantaged elementary children with collegiate athletes through a digital pen pal platform called the Chins Up Exchange. So at our event, we're going to have a few badgers there playing bocce balls, signing autographs, we'll have drinks and food. So I, I appreciate the plug, Andy. We would love to have you all there. Um, just come on by. You don't need to register in advance. It's, it's $20 at the door. But uh, yeah, just as kind of a, a hats off to Andy, it was like seven weeks ago where he came to the group and said, hey, I'm kind of toying with this idea of like a mobile bike repair business. And our, uh, our group loved it, and we, uh, we encouraged him to run with it. And it's just been such an inspiration and motivation to see where he's gotten in seven weeks' time. So again, Andy, congrats, man. That's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of you for coming out. Keep coming back. <laughs> Do you have any questions about all the networking? Talk to Rachel or talk to me all the time. I love my person. <laughs>